So this right here is something absolutely mind blowing, but I don't want to spoil this just yet. Let's start right here. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about creation of life. And I wanted to start the story with something that you probably are all familiar with, the Frankenstein's monster. And that's right, I'm not saying Frankenstein because as you probably know, it's not actually called Frankenstein. Frankenstein was the doctor that created the monster. And that is Frankenstein's monster. Now, back in the days when I was, I think, maybe in elementary school, I think this was probably my first introduction to science fiction. And I remember after reading this, imagining this idea of basically combining different parts of a creature, running electricity through it, and creating life. This was absolutely mind-blowing. And I remember even kind of attempting something similar, although I think I didn't really use electricity. And luckily my mom was quick enough to stop me because I probably would have hurt myself. But this idea of creating life is something that fascinates all of us, or most of us, or I guess it fascinates me and this other person whose study I'm discussing today, and that person took it a little bit farther. He actually took it to the next level, and I can only imagine he probably went, Mwahahaha. I'm sure there was an evil laughter involved somewhere. Anyway, so what we're talking about today are two separate studies with a relatively similar conclusion and an absolutely mind-blowing conclusion. They both created artificial life from, in some sense, either nothing or something that was not supposed to be life. And in some sense, we can actually call these synthetic living machines. So it's almost like, you know, those um, androids in Blade Runner, which are kind of human, but not really human. So it's that, but way simpler, like basically bacteria. Nevertheless, what these scientists were able to create is absolutely fascinating. And I wanted to start with the first one that used these funny little guys. These are Sinopus levis, also known as the clawed frogs. And what the scientists from the first study decided to do is capture some of the stem cells from one of these frogs, specifically skin cells from the frog's embryo, and then they separated those stem cells and allowed them to grow into their own little things, the objects that the scientists referred to as xenobots. And so surprisingly, these stem cells from those frogs basically started to grow into their own independent creatures, their own entities. They first organized into little clumps, they then started to assemble into more complex shapes, and then three days later they even acquired an ability to move around, beginning to swim independently using the tiny tiny cilia, tiny protrusions, which are normally used for some completely different purpose. And so interestingly, if you were to look at these cilia, these tiny hairs that all of those frogs usually possess when they're older, their main purpose is to actually spread the slimy material across the frog. That's why when you pick up certain frogs, they do feel very slimy. At the same time, they often protect the skin from various pathogens, from various dangerous bacteria, from fungi and so on. So their main purpose is to move stuff around and to spread stuff across the skin of a frog. But for those unusual xenobots that uh, essentially were created from the stem cells, and that self-assembled into larger objects, suddenly the same cilia had a completely different purpose. They allowed them to swim around, which essentially turned them into a completely new type of life. And weirdly enough, all of this happened within three days. There was no evolution evolved, this was not due to some sort of a selective pressure, this is just something that happened absolutely naturally. And remember, these organisms have no brain, they have no actual nervous system, and each of them is very, very tiny, only about one millimeter in size. But they were able to easily navigate and to even go through various tubes and even interact with their environment to some extent. According to the scientists, they were also even able to heal themselves when damaged and would regain their original shape if they were somehow cut by something. And so, hypothetically, they basically created these new creatures, but they couldn't really eat anything. And they also had no digestive system. Because of this, they could only survive for about 10 days, unless put in a sugar solution where the sugar would just get absorbed through the skin. In that case, they survived a little bit longer. And so it's super interesting how the scientists were able to create life out of something that was basically just a part of something else. It's as if you were to take a cell from your own body, put it in a tube, and suddenly it became its own functioning life out of nothing. Being able to self-organize, being able to propagate itself, being able to even navigate or possibly absorb materials, which means that one day the scientists are going to find a way to repurpose this into creating some sort of a biological system that can actually function like a typical biological robot. 
maybe being able to deliver some sort of a drug into someone's system, or for some other really cool purpose we can't even imagine right now. All of this thanks to these little cute guys. But that's just one of the first experiments, and this is just one of the first discoveries. The second one took it a little bit farther, and a little bit closer to that idea of Frankenstein's monster. And it's actually related to that first image I showed you in the beginning. It's what you're looking at right here. Now, to try to understand what's happening here, we basically have to understand what the scientists were trying to create a few years ago. Or more specifically, back in 2003. The scientists were trying to create an artificial virus that could then infect certain bacteria. And they did so by combining genes from certain organisms into one single genome. So in other words, they were able to generate artificial genome that then infected the bacteria. And back then, this was a groundbreaking discovery or a groundbreaking achievement, which essentially gave some other scientists a completely different idea. Okay, one thing is to create a virus, but what if we try to create a bacterium as well, completely from scratch, from basically just the genes necessary for a bacteria to function, to propagate, to replicate itself, to do all of the necessary life things. In other words, they wanted to create an absolute basic bacteria that would be qualified to be called life. So artificial life with absolutely minimum genome. And the first version of this bacteria was originally created back in 2010, when the scientists were successfully able to design the first ever synthetic bacterial cell. A cell that the scientists referred to as J. Craig Venter Institute version 1, also known as JCVI Syn1. And this was essentially the first ever organism with a completely synthetic genome with the actual genes themselves combined together from other organisms. But back then, back in 2010, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't actually performing as well as they hoped it would, and so in some sense it was just the first version of this experiment. And since then, the scientists from this institute were able to produce a few more versions of this cell, making it better and better every time. And so, for example, the version from a few years ago, the version 3 of this cell, contained about 480 genes on the inside, and could easily build proteins and even replicate its DNA, but unfortunately, upon reproduction, would not really produce equally sized spheres. It would actually produce cells that would be very different in size and eventually kind of become really hectic. But it was already almost perfect. And so the most recent version, the version that was just announced a few weeks ago, version 3A, was able to reproduce normally, produce absolutely regular cells, and in some sense could be almost indistinguishable from a typical bacteria, with the reproductive activity visible in this video produced by the scientists behind this paper. And so interestingly here, this bacterium contains 492 genes, and a typical natural bacterium, so something like E. coli, will usually have about 10 times more genes. So there's definitely a lot of extra materials and a lot of extra genome present in a typical bacterium compared to the synthetic one. But remember, the purpose of this experiment was to create something with absolute minimal requirement for life. And one of the major discoveries from this version of the bacterium is that there are at least seven genes that are absolutely necessary for normal cell division and for normal cell reproduction. So the scientists behind the study were able to identify these very specific genes, which they now are certain are required for cells to divide normally. And so by conducting these types of studies, the scientists can now start identifying genes inside bacteria that are necessary for life, and some other genes that are probably just extras. So things like what we refer to as junk DNA, or some other things that are probably just leftovers from evolution. But in order to create the bacterium, you still need to have some sort of a shell. Basically, you still need to have the body part. And in this case, it came from a sexually transmitted bacterium known as Mycoplasma genitalium. This particular bacterium usually does the same thing as chlamydia, it has very similar effects. And so by taking the bacterium, extracting its DNA, and then putting their own DNA into it, they were able to create their own synthetic bacterial life. But the question here is of course, why, right? Why would you even want to do this? Isn't it kind of dangerous? Well, the thing is, by being able to create these very highly controlled bacterial cells and also knowing exactly what's in them, the scientists can now start controlling the bacteria in the way that they want to control it. So the best example here is, of course, once again, pollution or even things like living sensors. For example, you can now create a bacterium with very specific genes that's able to detect something in the environment and then somehow transmit it 
so that we can actually detect if there is something going on, some kind of a pollution or some sort of a dangerous situation happening. For example, you can have a bacterium whose only purpose is to detect high acidity or high pollution levels in a certain lake somewhere. And if that happens, you can then have it notify the scientists by, for example, changing color or maybe emitting some other molecule. So basically, these would be like biological sensors. At the same time, you can also create a bacterium that's able to consume some sort of a material and remove it from the system. Lastly, one of the other potential uh, uses for this is theoretical use. So hypothetically, you could actually create a bacterium that's able to create necessary drugs. So for example, let's just say there's a person that requires some sort of an injection all the time. It can be insulin, it can be something else. Maybe it's a person that's just unable to inject themselves or doesn't always have the drug on them. Now imagine creating a bacteria that's able to produce this material, such as insulin, and injecting it only when it's necessary. So maybe it's some kind of a bacterium that's able to detect low sugar levels and just releasing the insulin as it's needed and then disabling itself when it's no longer required. And this type of medical bacteria could hypothetically take us to a completely new level of medical sciences. Being able to effectively engineer bacteria specifically for the needs of a person and being able to generate medicine that basically stays in your body and kind of lives with you but makes you better, especially when you need it the most. Now that is something that's technically, for now at least, science fiction, but based on these studies we're getting really really close to it. With the first step being of course this, the empty tiny shells that kind of mimic life. They're able to reproduce, they're able to survive, they're able to create miniature copies of themselves, but they don't really do anything else. Whatever other functions they need, we give them later. And so in that sense, I think both of these studies are absolutely brilliant in what they were able to create and discover. Now maybe a little bit scary, but brilliant nevertheless. But for now that is all I wanted to mention because this is actually going to be a topic for some of the future videos as well. So check out the papers in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't because I'm going to make sure to make more videos on this and share this with someone who loves learning about science. Either way, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Stay wonderful and as always, bye bye. But I just hope that one day these tiny creatures don't end up being some sort of a black mirror scenario. In other words, I hope they don't take over the world.